All right, good morning. Could you please state your full name and how long you've been at RIT, please? Uh, Marcia Trauernick, and I have been at RIT about 38 years. Thank you. Today is Thursday, May 9th, 2024, and it is 9.36 a.m. I am Sophie Tomla, an RIT Archives Oral History Program student assistant, and I am here with Marcia, the director of RIT Libraries. Marsha has just announced her retirement from RIT this summer. My supervisor, Landon Hatch, who is the Marie Golisano Graham Outreach Archivist, is also present and may chime in from time to time. Before we get started, may I have your verbal consent to record this interview? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So today we're going to do what we call a memory aid session. So first, we're going in sections. So first I want to ask about some staff life and how you felt the community was working in RIT libraries while you were here. Okay. So, while exploring the Wallace Memorial Library records in the archives, I came across many posters and invites for library staff events such as picnics and staff competitions. Did you partake in these events? I think I did for most of them. I can't tell you offhand what every single one was, yeah. but yeah, it was usually a group effort to build teamwork and, yeah. and just to have fun with each other. All right, so we have some pictures of these if you'd like to flip through them. Okay. So we pulled this one, Marcia, because you're right there and you're very stylish in that photograph. <laughs> when I was young and thinner, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that was some sort of staff presentation library. Yeah. What was the sense of camaraderie like when you were first starting at Wallace? Well, um, first starting, that was in 1986. You know, your first, if you want to call it cohort, was really the department and area that you worked in. So I was part of the people in the basement behind the scenes, which was um, cataloging, you know, acquisitions and serials and um, I think the IT folks. I'm not quite sure where they were, but... Um, they were, you know, part of the behind-the-scenes crew. Um, so you got to know those people first very well, and then you gradually expanded out to those people uh, from other departments that you worked on for work purposes. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, interactions really between all the departments of the library. And being such a small staff, it was certainly easy to get to know people. Uh, because you're only separ separated by a few floors rather than for like some larger universities at the time. There were multiple libraries on campuses. So that lent itself to being more of a cohesive group for the most part. But really the people you worked with day to day are the ones you got to know the best. All right, so there's one more bookmark in this photo set, I believe. Or maybe two more, we'll see. This is another one that you appear in. This is one of the library picnic events. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was at uh, the director's house at the time, uh, Pat Pitkin's house. Um, so there were um, library staff members and their families at that one. And so it turned out to be a, a pretty nice day. And, uh, you know, a lot of nice interactivities. It was fun. I think there was a croquet game or something going mm -hmm. on uh, mm -hmm. that was part of the action. So, yeah, it was really a nice time. And, you know, I recognize most of the people um, there in these pictures. Yeah, when we were all much younger. <laughs> All right, let me see what this last one is. Okay, I think we're going to skip that last one. Is there anything else you'd like to flip through in this photo book before we move to the second I one? I have no idea what's in here, so... Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Okay, that looks like more of the same party. Okay, this looks like it's the whole party portfolio for different things here. Yeah. 
you know, I think there was one time we had a party in Webster Park, and it was pretty cold <laughs> and wet. <laughs> so I think we stayed inside and played board games for that one. And if you notice a lot in these early pictures, most of the female staff members wore dresses and skirts most of the time. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Okay, and this looks like pictures from the early 1990s um, addition and renovation. So we lived and worked in the building during the whole time. Uh, right. So sometimes I wonder if we were really supposed to be <laughs> in there, <laughs> depending on what happened. But uh, yeah, we still kept everything open and running. You're also in some of these pictures here as well. Yeah, that looks like a huge group picture. That might have been when we won the ACRL award for, um, I can't remember the exact name, but best uh, academic library for the year. Yeah, excellence in academic libraries. Related then, to, oops, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say there's a lot of individual photos of staff. Oh, also here. here we have a spirit. What did you think of spirit? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> he's getting a little old looking like a number of people. Um, but I uh, guess that's one way he can live on. Related to what you were just saying with the um, ACRL award, Marcia, what are some of your proudest accomplishments during your tenure? <coughs> well, I guess, <coughs> excuse me, um, it was interesting that I continued to move up administratively during the times I was here. Um, I was fine with just doing a cataloger job uh, and I found out that I liked it and I think I did reasonably well at it and then became supervisor of some staff, then department head, and then um, added um, serials for a couple years and then um, you know, going more into the digital library realm. I was always involved with um, our development of an institute repository um, and working in that thing and with staff at the time created the digitization lab. So I've been very pleased with that and certainly being kind of the, at the time, the cataloging and metadata expert on staff. And, you know, I found there's a lot of similarities between my work in music theory and in cataloging, especially with counterpoint, I did really well with that. And there are certain rules that you have to abide for in um, Western uh, counterpoint uh, from predominantly the 18th century or um, 17th centuries. But yet, knowing the rules, there's ways you can break them for a very artistic or creative effect. And I found the same way with cataloging. There's books of rules for description, subject, uh, controlled vocabulary, but yet knowing how to work with them, manipulate them, and always providing concise but yet useful information in the records that describe what we have. You know, I think I did really well with that. And then for about 12 years, off and on, I taught um, the required course um, recorded information, or, or I can't even remember the name of it, anyway, for the library school at University of Buffalo. And, you know, for some of the students, it was like, yeah, it's required. And others were like, I had no idea it was this interesting. So. At the time, then, I had a, a number of practicum students work with us, and most came from the classes I taught. And I also was able to have money for small uh, time investments of different project catalogers. So I got to know more of the uh, catalogers in the area because of that. Most of them worked elsewhere, but they come in on evenings or weekends 
to do a little work. And I found that really rewarding on so many areas. Uh, once in a while, there might have been a practicum that wasn't maybe as successful as it could have been, but overall, I think for the most part, it was good for me and my staff to coach and mentor people in this area, plus get a little work done on the side for us. So I hope that answers your question. It does. Um, and just as follow up to that, because you said some projects weren't as successful, but just, you know, over your time, how have you defined success? Um, usually meeting um, whatever deadlines and in, in what the goal was. Um, probably the first year, um, it was decided, well, I guess it wasn't the first year, but early in my career here, once the new addition was built in the early 90s, RIT had stored pretty much the entire book and journal collection of Eisenhower College over in storage in Building 99. Um, and so I think that was one of the reasons that the addition was built, to house oh gosh, 30 or 40,000 more volumes. And so I was charged with hiring temp workers who came in every night or weekends uh, to do that and started out great. And then um, other things happened to some of these people's lives and then the project got a little behind. So I had most of it done, but I couldn't say I had it all completely done at the time. But given the whole first time I've managed a, a horrible project like that, it, it turned out okay. And um, another thing that I was charged with once I became department head, when I first came, there was a huge backlog of books to be cataloged. And many people don't know this, but I actually came on board in early January of 1986 as a temp worker uh, hired. And uh, one reason I knew about that job, since it was only advertised in the local paper, was that I had met um, my husband at a graduate school at the University of Illinois. And he had gotten a job at Eastman Kodak as a physicist. And so he says, oh, hey, look, you know, there's, there's this job, you know, it's up here. And I'm like, okay, I was always coming up you know, like second best in other job searches and so forth, so eh, why not? So I applied, I was asked to come in, I interviewed, and they're like, how did you know about this job? So there was a story there. And I was hired to work on this backlog, and it turns out I was the only person that applied, so it was really kind of an odd situation. And so I was hired for six months, and then you know, getting towards the end of my stay, one of the catalogers went and took a job at another uh, college. And so I applied for that job and I was awarded that. So though I started in January 6th of that year, my official date is May 16th. Uh, so by the time I leave, it will be about 38 and a half years that I've been here. Um, but over the years, I did work with staff, and so we gradually kept reducing the backlog of people. Right, well, in that, in the, the, the backlog of books, and as more technologies developed to do cataloging more efficiently and faster, uh, when people left or retired, because I had six people in cataloging when I started, and then it ended up we just had four you know, or, and then three. And those positions rolled over into being positions for our library systems department. So we're one of the lucky libraries that even for the size of our staff, we have a great systems department. And that's part of the vision of Pat Pitkin, the director when I came here, uh, to make sure we had support for the technologies we needed. Uh, so getting rid of the backlog, and we really don't have too much of one, you know, if you go downstairs for that, um, and that's really been taken up by that staff working with the thousands of ebook records that we put into the catalog on a regular basis. So the work is still there, you're just dealing with different formats. And uh, just being involved in a lot of projects and um, a few things 
outside of the library at RIT. When I first came here, librarians were classified as educational development faculty. So you could go up for a type of promotion, you know, and you could have that in your byline at the bottom of your email, uh, once we had email, and just have in parentheses whatever your rank was. And so by the time I was ready to roll for associate print, uh, professor in parentheses, uh, Dr. Simone came on board and said, you guys are not faculty. So that was the end of that, um, which is okay. I think for the size of our staff and what we do, having a mandatory faculty requirements like a number of other larger universities, I think would be a detriment just because nobody has time to devote 20 to 25 percent of their time on a regular basis to research. So I'd rather have people do it on their own and have quality work than people scrambling just to keep their job. That's really simplifying that fact, but I think we're okay the way we are. All right. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to look at in that photo book? I just kind of scanned through. I mean, it was certainly, you know, various parties with a lot of people that stayed almost as long as I have <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, at RAT, and certainly some shots of the 1990, you know, edition and so forth. Uh, and I just remember one time we were cataloging was kind of in a, a narrow rectangular room, so we were quite condensed with desks and then carts of books um, waiting for tapes to be loaded from records we had created on an online system. Um, and um, all of a sudden these chips of concrete were flying into the room. And it turns out workers were on the other side because we were on an outside wall. And they were using a concrete saw to start cutting an entrance. And we're like, oh, you gotta stop. So, okay, well, we'll just come in and go the other way. And we're like, okay. So they go in there and a of course the concrete was flying out, which is great, but the exhaust and fumes from the uh, concrete saw were really bad, so either way we just had to leave. And so once in a while there are a couple instances of uh, going out, but uh, for the most part everybody persevered through the whole thing. And I remember once it was done, and I'm not even sure exactly where all the books from the floors once everything was recarpeted where they were. But we all came in, the whole staff on the weekend, and we had um, captains and so forth, and you were on teams. And we moved all the books from where they were into the stacks, which for, for this last move, uh, we hired people because that's a lot of work. Um, and so all we got out of that was a sense of accomplishment, good work for the library and pizza. So. <laughs> we do have some more pictures of the 90s renovation if you'd like to look through those yeah. as well. Sure, you know, do that real quick. I think one thing that Sophie and I were struck by as we were looking through these documents um, is that perseverance, like you just mentioned, and just sort of, you know, doing the best you can is something that I think characterizes a lot of your time here because you went through two major renovations, um, the second time at the helm. And just how common is that for someone to go through major renovations like this during their library career? Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, how many directors escape the whole process. I know of my peers in the area in New York State and even others across the country, uh, there seems to be a, a thing in the last 10 years, maybe because of the age of various buildings, that there have been some sort of remodeling, either very modest refresh or um, a total redo like we had uh, for this library the past two years. Um, and so, you know, some of them have happened for various reasons, like at Geneseo, they're still not in the regular library because work was supposed to be done there a while ago, but then they found out there was asbestos in the whole building and all that. So there's various reasons 
why projects may turn out to be huge. But I think to go through two uh, major situations might be a little unusual, but I won't swear to it. <laughs> were there any, so you just told us that great story about the exhaust, but were there any lessons that you think you learned in the 90s renovation that helped you through the most recent one? I think a lot of it is just be prepared for things to happen that you have no control over. And while for this last project where we were pretty much not functioning in this building for the most part for over two years, I had a, approximately a third of the staff over at Ritter for service and so forth, and then another third working remotely for the most part and another third, including myself, stayed in the building the whole time. And so um, they're always building things that happened and sometimes they just happened, they weren't planned. Uh, like having no air conditioning in the summer was pretty miserable. Um, having two huge dehumidifiers on the second floor to help maintain some sort of decent climate for all the uh, archival and carry materials that weren't in the enclosed climate controlled area and you know several of us always had a routine of having to dump the water in the janitor's closet in the morning and usually do it again before we went home and then sometimes I'd come in the weekends if it was really humid out and dump things then. Um, so it helped a little bit. But just the dust and then constant interruptions of workers needing to be in certain spaces so you had to move things around. And um, the only good thing was Welliver was the main construction company and they were a dream to work with. I didn't work directly that much with the uh, construction company for the, the early 90s, um, but other people did and it was a, a very different setting. It, more of your stereotypical construction worker attitudes. But here, they went out of their way to help us do things, improve things, and that was probably the best construction experience I've had either here at RIT or elsewhere for that. Um, but I think the main thing is just deal with it and I told my staff here especially the ones in the building you know I expect people to deal with the situation with grace and good humor and I think that worked 90 percent of the time <laughs> there were still some instances where uh, things got a little rough um, but for the most part everybody pulled through really well I had wanted to nominate the whole staff for a staff council award but then I read the guidelines and you can't uh, nominate an entire unit. So I'm like, okay. Uh, but I think between this and changes and everything, plus COVID that everybody had to deal with, um, I think we're ready to have change that we initiate and not having to deal with things we couldn't control. So I think that'll be a big boon for everybody here. Oh yeah, lots of empty spaces. And some retirement dinners. There's also a section about a flood that happened. Were you involved in that happening? Which flood? <laughs> There's been more than one. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if, I don't think there's it's named, but there's, yes, there's a few pictures about the library there was flooding. There one where it, it's, it's it flood, okay, yeah, um, over a good part of the library. And remember everybody, first of all, running with waste baskets, to catch where the obvious drips or, or waterfalls were, um, trying to throw up plastic over books that hadn't gotten wet yet. 
and then a huge number of books we took to archives and carry just to start trying to help them dry out a little bit. Uh, I don't think I was involved, so I don't know if they shipped anything out to a professional uh, company to further dry them out and stuff. But yeah, you're right, it, it was pretty bad and it covered a good part of the library. Uh, so even back then, um, I don't know whether it was roof leaks or the HVAC system, but even now we still deal with some HVAC leaks uh, because things are either, pipes are either blocked or something's not set up right. And then um, we're hoping our roof can get fixed because that's another source of leaks. And the construction company really recommended to have that done while, but I guess there wasn't funds. So I've been told verbally that that's in the books for the near future. I don't know if that will happen, but that is a source of concern. Just, it's an old building and the roof is all patched and, you know, if you patch one place, then a gully occurs somewhere else. And so um, we still have our plastic and our buckets at the ready. <laughs> So when talking about the construction of the renovations, you mentioned making sure we're dealing with things with good humor. What are your thoughts about the construction mascot, Wally Wallbanger? I think that was um, the, the idea of the Associate Director for Public Services, Lois Goodman, uh, mm -hmm. idea. And it was just to kind of do something, yeah, I've got one of those t-shirts. <laughs> Um, do something kind of fun uh, to kind of, you know, like we're using the Lee Rubens cartoons to kind of, you know, make light or have fun with the situation. The same thing with uh, our former uh, communications and marketing a person, Sarah Cool, doing the neat little video, which had a hockey theme. Mm -hmm. uh, and we played that up with our hockey shirts and all this stuff. Um, and then I think it was the admin for the director at the time, uh, her mother could make dolls and so forth. And so she actually made this little doll with just feet and a hard hat. Uh, so, you know, it was cute. And then, you know, I think once we kind of moved back after the year, we kind of let that go. Right. All right. So last interview, we talked a little bit about how the library had to deal with the vandalism in the photo books and just other content. We do have a booklet from a campaign, I believe it's ran, it was ran by students, but it was for the Wallace Library called the Damage Noted Campaign. It was just a vandalism survey that was put out around the library. Oh, okay. And we have a little booklet if you want to look through that. I know, yeah, early on it was really, oh wow, a problem. Um, because, you know, I started in the era of no internet. And so either for personal purposes or for assignments, um, whatever reasons, um, we constantly had to deal with books being damaged and often parts torn or cut out. Um, and of course my department um, always worked to see, well, if it's just a few pages, can we interlibrary loan the book? photocopy those pages and then tip them in um, with a thin line of glue or was it so bad that the bibliographer had to decide do you want to replace this or not and if so we just had to order another copy and discard the other one um, as you expect with the advent of the world wide web uh, a dramatic <laughs> drop and this kind of um, vandalism. Not to say once in a while there may be something missing from a book, but very seldom do we find anything like that uh, versus what was going on 
you know, in the late 80s and the 90s. So, yeah. Um, and of course, as you expect, certain types of photography books may have been hit, and that led to a number of photography dealing with nudes and so forth being put in the archives just because of the content, not that they were exceptionally valuable or rare or anything. So I think not that long ago, uh, the former art and photo librarian had started to go through the archives and indicate what books could really go back on the shelves. Um, so that freed them up for public to use and also created more space for archives for other things. So yeah, it's just interesting just how um, things changed, uh, mostly because of the World Wide Web for that regard. And how have you, Marcia, as a leader, sort of navigated all the different and at times conflicting interests of, you know, not just your staff, but the faculty, students, if the provost has a particular vision? How do you navigate all of your different stakeholder relationships? Um, sometimes it's the best I can do. Um, at the moment, um, usually I find um, student concerns and faculty concerns um, they focus on different things, of course, but usually it's the same situations. Uh, for faculty, it's mostly, I really need these resources. You know, can I do anything about it or not? Um, and then for students, most of the time it's more on the, the physicality of the library, like is there a convenient place to study? Um, are there areas where it's quiet, uh, are there private study areas, that type of thing. Um, so more just their day-to-day -day comfort in a way, whereas faculty <coughs> are looking more for the library, in, you know, first and foremost, for the resources that they need. There's been so many times that either I experience or the college liaison librarians experience in meeting new faculty, they assume that everything they had when they were working with their doctorate, we have here. And unfortunately, that's not always true. And so they end up being rather disappointed. Now, of course, you know, we belong to the Rochester Regional Library Council. So anybody, you know, student or faculty or staff member at each library can get a WRLC borrowing card, which I believe are electronic now and they can go to any of the other libraries and check out books and so forth. And I know a lot of our liberal arts uh, people especially use the University of Rochester's library quite a bit. So that's always another thing. You don't have what we have, we're going to the U of R. Okay. Uh, but that's an ongoing situation, especially with RIT's um, incremental growth you know, even though they haven't stated this formally, we all know RIT likes to move to an R1 uh, status. And with the growing number of PhD programs and then some areas that we never had degrees of any type before, our library can't immediately uh, accommodate those research needs, which is very disappointing. Um, so those are the two main focuses that I see for both faculty and for students at this time. So I, you know, that's kind of the same thing that all academic libraries are dealing with. All right, moving on to our next section, we have events and achievements. Earlier in the day, you mentioned the Excellent in Academic Libraries Award. Um, so in 2006, we won the Ex Excellence in Academic Libraries Award. Would you be able to tell us how many time, oh, sorry, how times were at the library leading up to this receival of the award? Um, I think it was pretty much business as usual, and then people just contributed information and then I, th I believe getting like faculty and student input uh, for 
the write-up of the proposal, I believe the director at the time, Chandra McKenzie, was the one that decided to go for the award. So she and probably a few other senior staff members probably wrote the proposal. So it, it was more of an impact once we found out we actually received the award. And then, you know, people were rather excited, and we had um, the president, I believe, of the ACRL, uh, Academic and College Research Libraries Association from American Library Association, come to formally give us the award. And um, so that was quite exciting. And of course, um, I brought in a vacuum cleaner because the ones we had for our facilities folks weren't that great. And everybody cleaned and dusted and scrubbed walls and that just to make it look nice. And then also Dr. Simone, in honor of us receiving the award, invited the entire library staff to Liberty Hill for a dinner. And, and so that was quite nice. And so you saw some folks for the first time in your life really dressed up. <laughs> so it was fun just for that. And we're probably certain you already have one of these, Marcia, but Sophie did pull that. Oh, yeah, the little metal gold bookmark. I thought those were super cute. And I think, too, um, you know, they had a big celebration for the completion of the 1990-91 uh, addition to the library. Um, they had a big event with food and tours and stuff for the what was then the Nathaniel Rochester Society and so most of us had to wear black and white and be ushers and so I was at the back door to tell people how to get up to the main thing or use the library that was a or elevator that was available at the time and um, so that was another big celebration and I think we had the guest speaker Henriette Abram from the Library of Congress, who is designated as the creator of the MARC format, was the speaker and honorary guest, and she might have gotten a degree or something. I don't know about that, but that was also a big deal. So um, we really tried to do a big celebration for that. For this last one, eh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so our last session, we touched on a bit how the renovation of the library um, was being utilized by both students and staff and faculty. How, do you, how did you see the 1990s renovation being utilized by students, staff, and faculty differently than it had been before? Well, the feeling of the early 90s edition was it was just a, an extension of the traditional library that we just had uh, expansion for more print materials not only not just including the influx of books from Eisenhower College because a lot of the professors I believe came from that college to liberal arts you know for those disciplines and so they're like we want our books so that was one reason and our print collection was just growing and growing um, and then of course there was more space carved out for some additional staff. Our staff did grow from where it was when I came here. Um, and so it was nice, but just kind of business as usual. Just more space, more books, that type of thing. And this one um, was, it was very different in that it was really associated with the shed rather than being um, a renovation just for itself. And some of the things that happened um, were things that we weren't as thrilled about, like having almost two floors of classrooms in the building. Uh, we did get remote storage, which we had started on a smaller scale years before. Um, so, you know, all academic libraries have remote storage now in some capacity. So hooray, that's great. Uh, it was unfortunate once we moved all our older journals over there that there was another flood. That's why I asked which flood you were talking about. And it damaged some theses and then a number of journals that we couldn't replace because they were out of print. 
uh, because there was a plugged drain pipe. And so just starting off and then, okay, we have to move at the last minute to Ritter Arena. And so that was kind of a scramble. And then move all of carry and archives to one side of the second floor and different facilities and then staff having to figure out where they're going to be for two years. And then just having uh, the situation where we had one controlled entrance and exit, we have like 10 different ways to get in and out of the building. So, you know, that's another concern. And then, um, you know, Carrie uh, reading room, which was quite lovely, um, became a hallway just because of the need of the shed. And so Carrie folks were able to work with designers to make something good out of that as far as having an exhibition hall with many of the printing presses plus a maker space for printing in the shed. And so a lot of adaptation. Um, so, you know, I'll go on record saying that we weren't allowed to be involved with the design, uh, I think, which is what hurt the staff the most. And, you know, I couldn't do a thing about it. So that, I think the fall of 2018, when the plan was revealed and all this, you know, having to acknowledge that my staff, you know, felt angry. And then also the feeling of, why didn't you do something, Marsha? So I think that was probably the hardest part of my career here, was knowing I couldn't do a whole lot of anything, but just getting that feeling from staff. And that was, that was hard. But we were able, the leadership team and I, able to meet with Dr. Munson just to say, you know, we really like some changes. And so he was good enough to find funding to do some things to improve the situation, like uh, archives not being in the basement, um, and some additional funding to kind of help us do more with what was given to us. Um, so I do appreciate that. But it's taken us like the whole academic year to kind of get an idea of how this building really works with the shed and there's still I think a f another year or two of just fine-tuning to to deal with that but at least it all looks nice right now so we'll see how long white walls and light colored furniture last <laughs> and um, sort of after that fine-tuning period happens what do you anticipate the relationship between Wallace and the shed will be I think it will be good. We already have a good relationship with Tiff and um, Mike Buffalon. I don't know their new hires that well, um, but th I believe every other week they have uh, a joint meeting with people from the library and, and people from the shed just to talk about common issues or, okay, how does this work? You know, like one thing this year we had to deal with um, plays and concerts and stuff that occurred on nights and on the weekends when we would not be open that late. Okay, how does that work? Um, and then also I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do some joint programming once we, you know, f figure out, okay, what actually happens in the shed and what can we do to build on that or assist with that and, and vice versa. Um, so I think it'll be good and already from my home department cataloging um, years ago we received a lot of different materials for you know design and so forth uh, from one of the faculty members there and so we cataloged them and had them in bins so they were available but not really that usable or that attractive or did people even know we had them type of thing. So we've given all that to um, the shed and they're going to have their own materials library and we'll certainly be continue to help with that and so forth. So already you know we have a lot of different relationships there even though they're modest at this time. But I think you know it will continue to grow and you know, hopefully have more opportunities to do joint programming and stuff. And uh, sometimes we need to use their facility because we don't have a big space for big crowds in our library. So, um, yeah, I, 
I see this as a, a growing partnership. We have another object that we can relate to that. Um, in 2018, you mentioned that was one of the harder years in your job here. We do have a small annual report booklet from one of your first years mm. as library director for you to flip through and see the projects that were going on then and maybe spark some memories of that oh, okay. time. So do you want me to look at the places that have marks? Wherever you'd like to look. Okay. So I do want to call attention to that page you were just looking at. Oh Which yeah, the, the front. Um, the front, the message from the director. What was it like for you the first time you sort of saw yourself publicly recognized in that way? Um, I know it didn't bother me so much, except I really hate that photo. But <laughs> I did nothing to get a new one, except I thought about it this year and made an appointment. And then I was n not feeling well and didn't look that great. So I canceled that and never got around to doing a new one. Um, so that's probably my biggest thing. It's like, oh, I hate that photo. Um, but, you know, I was just trying to do something simple. And um, so, you know. And more or less just making sure everybody recognized all the great things that the library staff did. That's really the whole point of any of these reports. And a nice blend of on-site classes from Cary Archives, um, RIS, and then emphasizing our open access publishing and um, our institute repository and um, the platform for the institute repository always provides each month this nice little uh, map of the world and indicating uh, how many hits or uses in all the areas of the world uh, were generated and so it's quite impressive to see how many people actually access the Institute repository on a regular basis. And certainly um, you know, emphasizing one of our very special collections that's held in the archives um, is the Deaf Studies and History Archive, which is very, very unique in itself and really has a wealth of material, not only about NTID, uh, but also deaf culture and deaf history in general. And um, certainly, you know, the instructions, sessions that we teach, consultations, and we don't really s receive any more, you know, for a number of years, um, general reference questions and that type of thing, um, but more uh, consultations where students want a more in-depth conversation with a project or research and that has really you know shot through the roof so it's very rewarding that students recognize uh, how helpful uh, their subject librarian can be and just to really be serious about okay how do I find the best resources how do I use what I find and so I think that's been very rewarding Yeah, the only thing with these very small annual reports is that it never covers all the good stuff that we do. Um, I'm working with the leadership team now to do a different size and different style. It's more like a magazine um, in the report, so I hope that comes to fruition. But I really want to cover all the good things we've done in this past year and maybe a little more since, unfortunately, we just weren't able to do annual reports during all this renovation stuff. Um, and I think that should give everybody a, a more thorough snapshot of everything that happens in this library and how it affects students, faculty, and staff. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So I'm hoping it will be really good. And we're using a student group, Command G, 
to design the print and the online version. So uh, I've already met with our assigned designer and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And then I hope the next university librarian will continue to do uh, a similar annual report on, a, on an annual basis. <laughs> so. Um, so that names a bit of the library's accomplishment. I have done some research and found some of your personal accomplishments, namely with the Church and Synagogue Library Society. Would you like to talk about that at all? Oh, I can. Um, that's more of a, a volunteer gig I did for a number of years. Um, I decided um, for the church I was with at the time to uh, work with their library, so I kind of built up the collection, um, deaccessioned a lot of things that people had given that really didn't make sense for a church library. <laughs> um, and then I had a, a little team, mostly retired people, but I did have a high school student at one time that kind of worked in with the library and so forth. Um, and at the time, there was a local chapter of the Church and Synagogue Library Association. So I joined that because I figure get more information about what to do. And um, had a lot of my church staff go there too. So for a number of years, uh, we participated in that, and I think for a few years I was the president of that chapter. And then um, a few times I went, they had a national convention, uh, which in the 90s was quite big. But I think as time progressed, um, congregations became smaller. You've seen that in data reports in the news, or maybe funding wasn't as available, some ceased having libraries. And I think just with, again, the World Wide Web, uh, people being access information, um, some people still like buying their own materials. Um, and so there was a decline in that association and I became the national president in its final years and I had to pull the plug on that because there just wasn't the money coming in and just not as much interest. And so that was interesting, uh, working with two other people to close out the books and get statements from vendors. And since this organization was based in the state of Oregon, I had to work with the state of Oregon to fill out all the requirements and paperwork and so forth and uh, then decide with whatever funds were left over um, since we're a nonprofit, to give to another nonprofit. Uh, uh, so we, I think it was the National Council of Books or something library related. So that was unfortunate, but that um, gave me an experience in a different way of being a leader with what really was volunteers. And uh, so it was still a useful experience, you know, and of course giving some presentations. And then the last conference we had was here in Rochester. Uh, down the road at the Doubletree uh, Hotel and um, was able to get some people like uh, from IPI to talk about preservation, you know, physical preservation and uh, some other folks involved and, you know, know how to set up a conference even though it wasn't that huge. You know, it was still a good experience from that perspective. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of my volunteer work. Um, and so I'm ready to do something when I retire that's maybe a volunteer, but doesn't have to be with libraries, just for a change of pace. That sounds nice, yeah. Um, related to that, Marcia, because you mentioned you know, differences in leading a volunteer team, how would you characterize your particular leadership style? Um, I've been told I'm very... Um, I'm trying to think of the right word, stable. But um, I tend not to get over dramatic or too intense or excited. I tend to be even keel, even with dealing with problematic situations, because uh, I try. I never want to lose my temper with anybody because I fear every problem 
can have a solution and I'd rather work with people to address the solution and then get angry and you know fuss at somebody for you know whatever reason because I don't think that helps anybody to learn it just creates bad feelings and maybe some of that's from my own personal experiences of being put down or you know what have you that I want people to have as positive experience working here as can be had and that doesn't mean that there's you know clashes of personalities with the staff or things that happen but you know as some people say we're not a hospital it's not life and death so usually something that happens okay there's a way to fix it um, so I think part of it is just being as supportive as I can um, sometimes maybe some people feel I'm not strong enough and coming down on somebody and that's just not the way I am um, but I think I've carried through since I've been here this culture of for the most part being supportive of each other being eager to do new things and certainly everybody you know is very keyed in to customer service and being helpful and pleasant um, it's interesting, you know, in the first couple meetings I had with uh, the provost, Prabhu David, that he was like, oh, it's so nice to go in the library. Everybody's so pleasant and helpful. And that's just with him at the time just kind of passing through for whatever reasons. And so just, you know, with kind of a, a general observation, not even, you know, huge interactions, just to have that ambiance I think is a wonderful thing. And um, I hope that continues. That sounds like a really good leadership mindset based on learning. Um, speaking about your leadership, do you have any advice that you'd like to share for your successor as a university librarian? Well, part of that might depend on who, who, who it will be. <laughs> right. um, you know, I think starting out, and anybody probably at the candidate stage of their work experience in libraries would be just to get to know the staff, just to get used and observe, well, what happens now? And, you know, certainly think about things. You know, could some things be tweaked, some changes be made, but just to figure out, okay, what makes the staff tick? and then bring them in, you know, and I see these things that would work much better if we did this and this and this. And I think just having that um, cooperation or letting people have voices and still, you know, make it clear that any decisions come to the university librarian. And there may be times where, oh, some people, even though it may be best for the library, it's uncomfortable for them to recognize that and to see, well, how can we alleviate this discomfort or, you know, how can I help you adapt to these new changes? Because I'm sure at some point, whoever succeeds me will be making some changes. I mean, if I continued, I see some things that I would do. Um, and some things that if we hadn't had this whole building experience for two or three years, I might have made during that time. Uh, but part of it is f because of the building, uh, just to make things as easy for staff when they're dealing with this added stress of this uh, physical change of what's going on here on campus. So I think that would be the best thing. And I would think if they're good leaders, they would know that. Uh, but I am compiling a lot of documents and information for the next person since this is the first time in over 40 years uh, a library director is coming in from the outside and not through the library. So that will be a little different for people too. They won't know this person. Um, and I think, you know, I always be around if they want to talk to me because my husband's still going to work here another four or five years. Uh, but I'll leave that up to them because it's a fine line between getting some intel versus making your own 
opinions about things. And so I'm just going to leave that up to them. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. And just to recognize um, this library has always been a little different in a good way from a lot of more traditional academic libraries. And just to work on getting the resources and partnerships and so forth that will benefit the staff that maybe have already even started, but just to do more of that, because I've been really focused internally with the staff since I've been uh, director here. So I think somebody that does more outward facing work is what we need. Can I ask you to expand upon something you just said, Marcia? Um, uh oh. <laughs> it, it, no, because I just I think it's a really unique point to highlight about your vantage point. Um, is that you know, you said for the first time in forty years, this isn't someone coming from internal. What particular strengths do you think that has lended you, sort of making your way up to the very top? Well, I think as far as you know, becoming a department head and then adding additional responsibilities, kind of still focused on that level of position, uh, was just my ability to work with people and teach people and um, make it as easy as possible for them to learn new things and be comfortable doing new things. Um, and then, you know, after decades, uh, even though we have a lot more new staff in maybe the last five to eight years, uh, when I started, a good percentage of the staff were the same age, late 20s to early 30s. So we are all very similar in that regard, and so in some ways we all kind of grew up through the library. So you really get to know people, you know, for 20, 25 years and stuff. And I think just knowing people, you know how best to have them do their best work. And also you're familiar with more of the culture of RIT. Uh, sometimes it feels, some years it feels like a harder place <laughs> to be than others um, for whatever reason. But just to get used to, okay, what are the these faculty members like as compared to other places. What are the students like? And a lot of times the students are kind of a different breed here, even after decades, um, as far as the combination of arts, humanities, and STEM, um, and then just the emphasis on creativity and, and so forth. I think this is a very unique place, and I hope that remains. And part of that is getting to know the people and how best to have them do their best. So that's kind of a, a wishy-washy answer. But knowing the people has certainly helped. Once in a while it may hinder things because you're like, oh, let's not do that because that's not going to work, you know. Um, but, you know, it could be a time where, okay, at this point, uh, looking at what the library needs and helping people adapt to any change that needs to happen. But I think just familiarity with the place. And I think too, um, this time around, and I'm not sure if this has happened in the past, but having a search firm conduct the search and having an institute-wide committee but still had a decent number of library staff members on the search committee has been a real boon and I feel really happy that RIT treated this position seriously uh, to give us the status it needs and the importance that it needs. So I'm hoping whoever the new, next university librarian is, that they live up to that expectation. Yeah, and um, we know that you had a hand in the sort of changing of the title name. Yeah. Um, could you just speak a little bit more about that on your vision for the university librarian? Sure. Well, part of that is, uh, in many of the R1s and larger universities, you know, as I mentioned earlier, librarians, professional librarians, they may have some sort of faculty status. And so, in many cases, they actually 
have seats on active seats on the faculty senate and you know all this good stuff and we don't have that here and then if you look around at titles throughout the institute there are so many different types of directors for so many different types of positions and they're not all equal in in status and also you know since we don't have faculty status um, I mean a lot of places you know there's a dean of libraries well I don't think here that would go over very well uh, because we're not faculty but I think having the title university librarian raises the recognition up to, to elevate it so it's a little more equitable to that of a dean um, so I think that will just help give more recognition to the importance of the library. And also it's a unique enough title that it kind of gets away from the director pool that there seems to be so many variations on a theme for so many different areas. So I just felt it just gave a little more importance to that position and therefore the library, that it's more on an equal academic playing field. So that was my reasoning behind that. And I know um, recognition, not only of the library, but of your staff has been a sort of common theme here. Um, but sort of related to that, I did want to ask, because um, you had mentioned you know, your focus has been on internal relationships, but external relationships as well. Um, how have you f sort of uh, tackled misconceptions of the library? I know sometimes with the STEM programs, they don't understand that the library is for everybody. You know, or just sort of non-traditional users of libraries and understanding that this is a space that they can also utilize. Well, I think, you know, if you're talking more about the STEM disciplines and even business to a certain degree, as far as the resources, they're pretty much all online. So there's no need to actually come to the physical library. When I first started, as I mentioned before, everything was on print. Um, I worked the reference desk two hours a week. So after several years, I got to know the print resources for a lot of things really well and just hope nobody ever asked me a law question. Um, but then we started getting, you know, a CD-ROM with a database and then a few more CD-ROM databases. And then, oh, some are starting to be electronic and then that all grew. And of course, as you know, with each vendor, they have a very different interface and platform. You know, a lot of the searching practices are the same, but it's not always intuitive, depending on what you use. So that was a big change, too. And of course, if you can just go and find an article at your desk uh, or in your lab, that's wonderful. And so we've been able, because of the emphasis in STEM disciplines at RIT historically, we have a lot of electronic resources that provide a great deal of what these people in these fields need for resources. So they're not as um, interested, I think, in library resources like College of Art and Design and College of Liberal Arts and even NTID. Um, and Arts is, does pretty well on campus, but um, our liberal arts programs, some of them are growing and actually getting degrees associated with them. And so that's an area that historically the library has not really collected a lot in. Um, so I think just convenience to resources has kind of underplayed the importance of what else the library can do for a number of faculty in those fields. N not that that's true across the board, but as long as they can get what they want electronically, however they find it, um, they're happy. And it's not the case for all disciplines. And I think too, um, the more the liaison librarians work with their colleges, just to <coughs> encourage them to send uh, their students to the librarians or work more to create assignments and then we can tailor the instructions that 
um, support the assignments. And those are much more effective than coming at the beginning of the year and say, here's some databases you know, and let's practice some searches. But then again, if you don't have a reason to use them right away, you kind of forget or it doesn't matter. So I think there's a combination of things. And I think the liaison librarians are, are continuing to go, do a good job. And as I said earlier, consultations with students are increasing each year. And so <clears throat> I think it's just more marketing, more outreach, that type of thing. And then I think, too, you know, faculty are finding, oh, these librarians can also help them maybe navigate some of the AI stuff as far as like, oh, I just used ChatGPT to uh, kind of draft this article on something, and it gave me some great references. Uh, did you check the references? Oh, well, most of them don't exist, you know, so it's just critical thinking, which we've always tried to emphasize in what we're looking at, information literacy, digital literacy. So there's partnerships there that everybody can learn from. So it'll be interesting to see how the library can keep their hand in all the AI work that's starting to go on, and uh, just to see how well we can contribute to that and get recognized for that. <laughs> All right. Do you have any thoughts on how you want your time at RIT to be recognized or remembered? Well, that's interesting. I'm not the most dynamic person. As I said, you know, I focus really more internally this whole time. Um, so I'm not really sure how to answer that because uh, I would for myself like to be remembered at least by my staff as being supportive and encouraging in in that type of thing I have no idea what other people will think about me um, I didn't get fired so I guess that's a good thing <laughs> um, so I must have been doing some things okay but uh, I'll just leave whatever the consensus is up to others because I have no idea what people might think down the road. You know, after a few years, I'll just be a name on a piece of junk mail that somebody will say, now who was this again? <laughs> or what do I do with this? And that's normal. All right. Are there any other questions that you have for us or any other topics that you'd like to talk about today? Um. Hmm. Not really. I mean, the whole thing is just, you know, I want to make sure rec people recognize what a great staff this is and all the things this library does do. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm hoping future university librarians will be able to really um, harness more resources in many different ways to let the staff show everybody what can really happen in this library. So I think we've gone through a lot of murky years, you know, with COVID and then this building business. And so I think now um, we're ready to go and get back to business and do some wonderful things. And I'll still be around to check in on people. <laughs> Well, I think that's a great spot to leave us at. Um, thank you for your time, Marcia. We've really yeah, enjoyed this. You're welcome. Thank you.